Namaskar everyone. I Anil Duvedi. Welcome you all for today's uh, webinar titled Collection Care of Paintings. This is our third webinar and we are really grateful to see your generous uh, participation from all over the world. Before I move further, let me welcome to webinar panelists. Member Secretary IGNCA, Dr. Sachidadan Joshi. Thank you, sir. Head of Department Conservation, Dr. Achal Pandya. Thank you, sir. And the today's, today's speaker, Kate Samuel. So thanks, Kate. And uh, now I'll invite Dr. Joshi for his welcome address so we can start the ses today's session. Please, sir. Uh, very warm good afternoon to everybody. Kate Simor, my dear friend uh, from Netherlands, my colleague, uh, very dynamic. Dr. Achal Pandya and a very bright uh, colleague, uh, Sri Anil uh, It is indeed uh, my pleasure to welcome you all in this uh, webinar that is Collection Care of Paintings. Uh, we know it is an important uh, subject and it is very heartening to see more than 150 participants already joining this, uh, not only from India, but also a few from Netherlands. That is what Kate has told us. Some of her students are also joining That's So it, it is really become a, a global uh, event. Uh, we know that IGNCA and SRAL Netherlands have been working together for the last four years, uh, thanks to uh, the efforts put up by Kate and uh, Achal. So we have organized a series of seminars and workshops uh, during these uh, last four years. Uh, today's uh, webinar is important because we are trying to uh, bring together the artist community to understand and know how their collection can be conserved and preserved. Especially in the, in the time of this pandemic, we have realized that there are few things which we are supposed to do on our own taking initiative. So if we know the technical uh, technicalities, we know the technical know-how, if we know the nuances, I think it would be it would be much beneficial for all of us to understand how our paintings can be preserved and conserved. Uh, with due regards to the creative genius of our artists who create a remarkable piece of artwork uh, through their expression, in painting through different mediums. Uh, they do not uh, really know about the, about the technique uh, through which they can conserve. Uh, an eminent painter, um, uh, Sri Vasudev Kamaji, who also happens to be one of our trustee, and you can see his painting right at the back of me, the back of me is, which is Hanumanji's painting, which is a remarkable painting, remarkable piece of art. When Vasudev Kamaji uh, discussed this matter in our, one of our meetings, he was, he was very sensitive and passionate about the fact that artists must know uh, how they can conserve their paintings. So, so it is his initiative and thanks to Sri Vasudev Kamaji for really giving us an insight uh, so that we can organize this kind of workshop where artists understand the art of conservation for their paintings. It is also very important for uh, many, uh, many scholars who are dealing with these kind of objects, maybe in museums or in archives or in libraries, even or in their personal collections, uh, to know about the art of conservation. Though I am not a technical person in this field, whatever I could gather from experts like Achal and Kit, I realized that their stress is more on the uh, preventive conservation and doing conservation through natural uh, things which are which are non-chemical, which 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 do less harm, which you can do with minimum of things uh, which are which are available in our nearby places, which are easily available. So those are the techniques. These are indigenous techniques. There are some old traditional techniques through which we can preserve these things. Uh, I am happy that today we have. Uh, uh, experts who can who can tell you about the about the art of um, conservation collection of paintings 
and uh, with, with the presence, august presence of uh, expert like Kate Seymour, uh, who, who we know is she's an international authority on that and she would be happy to share her knowledge and expertise. And then of course we have Achal Pandya ji, who is our head of the conservation division and he has also evolved some very important techniques. I welcome all the participants and uh, thank Kate. I may not be continuing for the whole session, so I must take this opportunity to thank Kate Seymour for taking out her time to be with us. And thanks to Achal and his entire team at the Conservation Division for putting up this nice show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for kind words. These events cannot be possible without a direction. And we are really thankful for your consistent support. Thank you. So let me begin, uh, move further. Paintings are the best medium to express thoughts. If we this slide, thousands of the messages can be conveyed without seeing, without saying even a single word. This is an old tradition and uh, being practiced from the centuries. But due to its nature and other factors, the paintings are facing problem. If you take one fact, the humidity, and if you see this painting, and if you go further, it, will, it, it has a different layers on it. And if you are taking the example of the humidity, the first, the two layers from the right, it's organic in nature. And it's, a, it, it's really affecting a lot with the humidity. And then what is happening because of the fluctuation in humidity, it's experiencing contracting. And then it's exact the pace on the top layers and it's led to the crack and uh, flaking, et cetera. And this results in crack and flaking. If you are handling such art, if not, uh, if not in right, right manner, definitely you will meet a problem. So this is the webinar of collection of care paintings addressing such issues. And we have Kate Shemur with us, one of the best expert of, the, of this subject. Kate is head of education and painting conservator at SRAL. She is also associated with the Indian Conservation Fellowship Program. You all know about, about this. And uh, I'm not going to say more about it because I already read about the uh, so social media sites about, about her. So I'll thank to Kate for uh, accepting this proposal to speak on this subject. And uh, now I'll officially inviting Kate to start her lecture. Over to Kate. Well, welcome everybody and thank you very much for Dr. Yoshi and Anil Devedi for their very kind words of introduction. It's really a great pleasure to be here and to speak from my home in the Netherlands to uh, my wonderful friends and colleagues in India, but also well around the world. I see some uh, familiar names from Italy, from Greece, from Portugal and from the Netherlands. So it's... Um, one of the plus aspects of this COVID uh, situation is that we're being able to organize these webinars. So it's a great honor to be invited by um, IGNCA to give this talk today. Um, my talk today is going to based on collection care for paintings. I work and live in the Netherlands, so my um, idea of what a painting is may be slightly different from those in different parts of the world. Um, so I'm really going to focus on my area of expertise, which is uh, Western canvas and panel painting, and some of the um, uh, ideas that I will express today are really relevant to those rather than more paper-based painting um, artworks. Um, a little bit of a further introduction, I thought as um, we have a very wide audience today um, to give a little bit of uh, an overview of the institute that I work in and where I am speaking from today. So I work for the Stichting Restauratie Atelier Limburg, we call it SRAL, which is in Maastricht, um, which is uh, in Limburg, the southernmost province of the Netherlands. You can see here in the map behind the, the image there. Our institute um, is almost 35 years in existence um, and uh, our core business is conservation and restoration of painted surfaces, education and training in the field of conservation and restoration, uh, research development, 
preventive conservation and advice. And today I'm going to combine some of those aspects together to do a little bit of an overview of uh, collection care for paintings, um, which is, uh, as Dr. Yoshi said, more based on the preventive conservation than uh, restoration work. In terms of uh, uh, restoration, we do have a number of studios. We have about uh, 12 um, uh, conservators working for us on a permanent basis, and uh, we supplement with uh, interns and fellows from around the world. So um, there's ample opportunity for those who wish to come to do internships to come and work with us for a little while. Um, we have departments of easel painters, polychrome sculpture, historic interiors, gilt leather and modern and contemporary art. And you see here some of the images of my colleagues um, at work. Um, as you see, our objects are mostly uh, um, paintings, but we do do some three-dimensional um, polychrome sculpture as well. Um, in terms of what I do at the Institute, I'm the head of education and as such organize uh, teaching programs for universities, the University of Amsterdam, where my conservation students uh, come from, the University of Maastricht, where we work with bachelor science students, introducing them into conservation science and uh, how to investigate paintings. But also, we work a lot with um, continual professional development courses for mid-career conservators. And Dr. Yoshi also referred back to a number of those that we've held in India at IGNCA. So we very much uh, appreciate our partnership in India with IGNCA and the ability to give these workshops to the larger field there. Um, as uh, Anil mentioned earlier, we're also very much involved in international conservation programs, such as the Indian Conservation Fellowship Program you see here on the left. And um, this has been running since 2012, um, where we train a number of Indian conservators each year. And unfortunately, this year, due to COVID, uh, we've had to um, you know, pause the program for a little while, but we'll be picking it up again next year, uh, spring, with a, a number of fellows coming from um, India to our institute. Um, we also work in Russia. And actually this week I was supposed to be in Russia in a city called Omsk, giving a workshop there, um, which I do every uh, year uh, since 2013. Um, so we, we really like being on the global scale and being able to disseminate our understanding and knowledge that we have gained over the last 35 years as an institute. Um, just to finish off my introduction to our team, here we see um, our team uh, about a year ago, uh, where we see our conservators, our fellows. Um, there's a couple of Indian uh, uh, conservators there that I can see. Um, um, we see Jitender who, from IGNCA, who I hope is maybe listening in the audience today. Um, what am I going to talk about today? Well, today, uh, it's a big topic, um, care of collections for paintings. Um, and so I allocated a number of points that I would like to discuss a little bit about. We don't have very much time today, so it's going to be back to basics, talking about the basic uh, conditions that we want to care for our objects in, um, environmental guidelines and storage, and how we can display our objects, lighting conditions to handling uh, our objects, some tips on transport and packing objects, discussions about whether or not we should be glazing and putting backing boards on our uh, paintings, uh, how to frame, best frame paintings, um, and I'll touch in a little bit about registration and condition reporting, as well as some technical examination methods. And lastly, um, I won't spend very much time on this. I, I will just talk a little bit about who should be cleaning paintings and uh, what um, dangers there are or uh, um, precautions we should be taking before we start uh, on this uh, irreversible uh, action. So begin with, really it's back to basics, uh, I want to look at uh, environmental, control, envir environmental conditions that we should be keeping our paintings in and what we should be watching out for. And I first want to talk about light. Um, light, as we know, holds um, 
energy from outside uh, beyond the visible spectrum. We have infrared energy in daylight as well as ultraviolet energy. And our artificial lights also produce uh, a spectrum of energy that is beyond the visible. Um, I think nowadays uh, there's a, been an awful lot of literature and review and the knowledge of the dangers of light are very well um, expressed. And I just wanted to bring that up to here for those of you working in larger collections that you may have different lighting conditions and standards for the different typologies of objects that you have in your collection. I'm showing you here uh, an image of a um, very recent exhibition in Mumbai um, where the lighting conditions have been adjusted for uh, the individual objects that you see in the display cases. Uh, external light sources are eliminated and um, this allows uh, the UV content uh, of daylight to be reduced. And we can eliminate these lighting sources by uh, using uh, filters on windows, uh, that can be quite expensive, but uh, more um, economical, uh, economically viable and sustainable ways is to apply screens or blinds on our window sources. Um, this is very important when you are working in, in uh, uh, collections that have not got uh, very extensive budgets. How do we know how much uh, light is uh, arriving at our objects? Well, we can set this within um, programs that uh, um, control our LED lights. But if we don't have that kind of system, we can also use uh, techniques such as the blue, blue wool standard that I'm showing here that will um, give us an overview of how much light exposure has fallen on objects over a set period of time. Um, this system uh, uses different uh, dyes that are light sensitive um, in wool. Uh, you place it um, half covered um, in uh, very close to where your object is and allow uh, the light fall to fall on this uh, um, standard. And over time, um, the wool start to fade as the uh, light in uh, degrades the, the color that is in the, the wool. Um, it's a 1 to 8 standard or an ISO standard and as you can see here in the lower image uh, which shows the fading, um, you get different fading conditions according to how much light has fallen on this. Um, this can be also used as a, um, as a monitoring system um, and uh, these blue wool standards can, are easily available. And I would recommend it in, um, uh, for displays of sensitive uh, materials, such as the textiles that I'm showing here on the right of the screen. Uh, here we can see a fluorescence, uh, artificial fluorescence tube that is placed directly in the display cabinet. And this is um, actively degrading and uh, um, destroying the color of these very beautiful Indian garments that I'm seeing there. Um, what is the uh, standards for lighting? Well, um, we want to be able to see our objects when we are in our galleries, and, uh, but the human eye is very good at picking up uh, details. Um, so depending on the typology of object, um, you know, we can work as low as 50 lux. And uh, to uh, mitigate these problems, we may want to rotate our objects um, within the gallery space so that they are uh, less subject to this light uh, um, falling on them. Um, light uh, damage is cumulative and irreversible. So once your object is faded, you cannot uh, reverse this action. Um, there is more knowledge and, and writing about this in, in various uh, articles. And for those who are interested in a fuller bibliography, I can provide that at a later date. Um, we also use light to create atmosphere. And the next two slides I'm going to show you are doing that. Um, this is a museum in Amsterdam called the Rembrandt House. Um, it is a small museum, which is a mixture of uh, um, historic building, 
uh, with a um, collection that is um, displayed in it showing the, seven, the, the timeline of, uh, around Rembrandt. Uh, so we see furniture, ceramics and paintings displayed in the, the rooms. Um, the lighting here is uh, a mix of uh, artificial light from interior, um, from hidden spotlights and um, daylight from the windows that you see in the left hand image there. And uh, the lighting is very, it is carefully and craft uh, designed to evoke an atmosphere of intimacy and um, uh, yeah, uh, to enhance the objects that you see. So we'll see some individual spotlights um, shine on uh, some of the art objects to highlight them and draw the viewer towards those objects. Um, this is a wonderful new exhibition in Jaipur House in the National Gallery of Modern Art in New Delhi, where they have um, uh, recently reopened, um, uh, I believe uh, in November last year, and um, they designed a new lighting track with LED, artificial LED shuttered lighting track. The actual windows are shuttered, and we can see here that the spotlights are carefully managed so that they fall directly on the, the art object. And because LED light has been used, it is, um, the UV content has been removed from the, the light source, and is thus, uh, uh, the brightness can be enhanced uh, with these very beautiful objects that they're showing here. Um, the next topic I'd like to talk a little bit about is uh, relative humidity and temperature. And in, um, we also have a lot of literature and uh, understanding now of the detrimental effects of fluctuations of uh, humidity and temperature on our artworks. And I'm going to talk a little bit through um, some basic concepts here um and to discuss options for um, mitigating these uh, problems um the best conditions for uh, our art objects are, are stable without fluctuations and if fluctuations are happening we want to keep those at a um, more reduced and manageable level so with uh, relative humidity our day fluctuations should not exceed five percent in either direction and our temperature should not exceed uh, four degrees centigrade in either direction. Um, the problems of relative humidity uh, or humidity exchange with our objects, especially our organic objects, leads to uh, various problems such as cracking and uh, desiccation. And you're seeing that in the middle image uh, of the screen of this very cracked uh, paint layers there. Um, as humidity levels fall, um, moisture is released from objects and these cause dimensional changes. Um, this includes uh, flaking and shrinking. But as uh, humidity levels rise, uh, canvases, uh, because of their woven nature, may also shrink. And at uh, levels of over 75%, uh, mold growth can be encouraged. So we want to avoid uh, these situations in our collections. Our collections uh, can, the, the, the relative humidity in our collections can be controlled through very expensive instrumentation that I'm showing here on the uh, left hand side of, uh, with a display case with uh, a microclimate held within that display, uh, display case. Um, many museums don't have the financial possibility to do this. And so we are encouraging a more sustainable approach to managing relative humidity. Um, while we don't want to move away from the, the set point, we want to think about keeping values in hot and humid cli uh, climates between about 28 to, uh, 22 to 28 degrees centigrade and between 55 and 70 percent relative humidity. Whereas in hot dry climates uh, such as Delhi, uh, we would like to keep our uh, temperature between about 22 and 28 degrees centigrade and our relative humidity we can drop the uh, the values down between 40 and 60 percent relative humidity. Uh, in temperate climates where I am situated uh, we want our set points to stay between 18 and 24 degrees centigrade and 45 to 65 
uh, degrees relative, uh, sorry, percentage relative humidity. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, our maximum variations of these uh, numbers should be plus 5% over a 24 hour period. Uh, how do we mitigate uh, if we're not using these very expensive uh, precision HVAC systems? Uh, well, we can look at alternative uh, localized instrumentation, um, such as placing humidifiers, dehumidifiers in our, um, in our um, display rooms and storage areas. It's very important also to, also to remember that we need to control the relative humidity and temperature in our storage areas. Um, we can also use um, silica gels or um, other means. Um, in rice is a very good absorber of moisture. But if we do use these, we have to um, remember to recharge them and replace them regularly. I've seen many uh, exhibitions where the silica gel is in complete saturation uh, point. It changes color often uh, at this moment, and these do need to be uh, replaced and recharged, otherwise they have no function. Um, glazing and backing boards on our objects, especially our paintings, can be used to uh, slow down and buffer um, exchange rates of moisture. And uh, perhaps we can avoid um, uh, placing our paintings on exterior walls, uh, which may have a different temperature than the interior walls. Um, this is especially important, we've noticed in collections in the Netherlands where um, the exterior walls are much damper than the interior walls. Um, air flows can also be used to um, move uh, air around rooms and air carries moisture with it. So this can also be a, a, a simpler way of uh, mitigating uh, buildup of uh, damp areas within your display or your storage areas. And uh, we should be um, using uh, instrumentation to measure this so that we can note um, problems when they arise. Um, it is very important to think about the placement of these measuring uh, instruments. I'm showing some here on the right hand side of the screen. As um, if you place them within air flows, that's not going to have the same measurement as in a dark and dank uh, corner of the room. So do think a little bit about where you're placing your relative humidity mo monitoring systems. Um, here I'm showing some problems that occur when we are looking specifically at canvas paintings as they um, absorb and release moisture. Um, we call this the mechanical behavior of canvas paintings. And uh, canvas paintings, I'm showing here uh, a schematic uh, drawing which uh, explains how they uh, react when they absorb moisture and release it. And the tensions that are built up within the stiffer, uh, less flexible layers uh, of paint, ground and paint on top of the canvas. And we see two damage um, to apologies that uh, commonly occur with canvas paintings. The, the middle image uh, shows a much more modern painting, uh, which has a zinc ground, and here we're seeing delamination between the ground and canvas layer, causing the paint and the ground to flake away. And um, in the image on the far right, I'm showing here a much older painting where again the delamination is occurring between the canvas and the ground. And this is caused over cycles and cycles and years of uh, moisture uptake and moisture release. So these can be avoided by um, caring for your collection in a uh, more sustainable manner. Um, on this topic of environmental conditions, the last uh, aspect I want to talk about a little bit is, um, is uh, uh, um, um, pollutants, pests and dirt. Um, here we're seeing the outside of a building in uh, Copenhagen. Um, it's the National Gallery and uh, they commissioned an artist to actually create uh, an artwork in the layer of pollutants that had um, deposited over the surface of the building. I hope you can see that in the detailed image that I'm showing now. 
um, there are sort of flames um, that have been rubbed away through the dirt lifts that are situated on the outside of this building. Now pollutants do um, enter into our collection, especially if we have windows and doors that are open. And I know in climates so that are not temperate, so hot and humid or dry and hot, often the windows are kept open to um, instigate airflow. Um, but we should be aware that that also brings in air from outside and that air may contain pollutants, but even also pests. Um, and this causes problems um, for uh, the accumulation of dirt on our objects. Um, what kind of problems? Well, I'm showing you here the end grain of a panel painting from the 15th century in Spain. Uh, which shows a, a massive insect attack. Um, actually, um, our research on this panel painting showed that there were two uh, typologies of wood boring insect um, that attacked this panel painting uh, at different phases over time. Uh, and the lower image that I'm showing is uh, a, a rather severe lady uh, who has um, not seen well, she's not been cleaned uh, recently. Uh, and what you're seeing is fly specks. Uh, so the uh, excretion of um, insects, flies uh, that contain acid material that are actually defacing her even more. And these dirt uh, and dust uh, pickups um, can also cause uh, huge problems for our artwork. So we're seeing here in raking light a, uh, on the far right, a, a close-up of uh, dust and dirt layers on the surface of a painting. Uh, these um, problems can be mitigated by closing doors and windows and sealing them. So if you have a well-sealed building, um, there is very little air exchange from the outside to inside, and uh, this can um, uh, reduce the um, effect of atmospheric pollutants on your artworks. Um, alternatively, we could uh, consider glazing um, fragile objects or individual paintings within collections that have sensitive surfaces. Um, and um, we also want to avoid uh, um, the uh, problems of mold and, and uh, biological infestation. And this again is a combination of ventilation, um, temperature control, um, humidity control, and uh, basically good housekeeping within our collection. Um, so this was a, a little overview of how the um, environmental conditions can lead to the, the, what in the field is called the 10 agents of deterioration and how they can be mitigated. Um, in today's climate, we are also dealing with collections that may or may not be closed to the public or even to the staff that care for them. And um, uh, there may be some questions uh, I can uh, foresee coming about what to do with your collection if uh, your museum has closed uh, due to the COVID-19 situation. Um, one of the leading organizations in the field of uh, uh, conservation is ICOMCC, the International Council of Museums Conservation Committee. And together with ICOM and uh, uh, one of the members in the field is Dr. Achal Pandya from uh, the head of, uh, of uh, conservation at IGNCA, um, has come up with a list uh, or some recommendations of what to do in these day, this day and age. Um, these can be found on the ICOM website, and a link has provided at the end of this presentation. And I'm not going to th go through all of the, the text that is written on the screen, it's quite considerable. Um, the advice is uh, geared towards uh, collection care and not specifically for paintings. But I've noticed in some of the uh, forums that are discussing these issues, there have been questions about what to do specifically uh, for um, aspects to do with painting collections. So I want to highlight a little bit of that. Um, when your museum has, or your institution has been closed, there should be um, a list 
of uh, essential staff that may uh, enter the, the institution on a daily or weekly basis to uh, manage the collection and make sure that everything is, uh, uh, is, is running fine. Um, the institution should provide a list of those uh, staff members um and on of staff members who are available for emergencies who may live in the, the vicinity and have not returned to their home uh, situation um it may be necessary to clean areas um, of access on a daily basis um, this would be doorknobs handles um, light switches um, the entrance to that uh, everybody is using uh, facilities, um, computer keyboards and so on. And these uh, hard surfaces can be cleaned uh, with uh, disinfectant sprays containing isopropyl alcohol or ethanol. But please do not use these disinfectant sprays on your artworks. Um, this could cause um, huge problems with them. And we really should, should be very careful when uh, we're given um, instructions for reopening um, to uh, avoid uh, damaging our artworks, our collections uh, with these um, uh, disinfectant uh, uh, instructions that we get given. Um, we should also be very much aware that if you are working with an HVAC system or filters for ventilation, uh, these should be changed, and not only in the collection, but also in storage. Um, these do trap um, the virus uh, or viruses uh, and should be changed anyway on a regular basis. So um, they should be carefully monitored in times of uh, COVID-19. If you are working in your conservation studio in these days, please be aware that um, extraction systems for uh, solvent extraction also do trap these uh, um, uh, virus, uh, um, virus uh, molecules and, and should also be cleaned or, or not used perhaps during these days. Um, when we are reopening, we should uh, think about a sort of deep clean of all the um, areas and surfaces that um, the public who go into our collections and, and want to enjoy them again um, should touch. But again, please be careful of um, using disinfectant on our objects. Um, dusting exhibition rooms. Dusting should start from the top, um, so high up places and move downwards to the floor. And the floor should be the last area to be cleaned. Um, and this is recommended that you do this at least once or twice um, as, uh, and change the water uh, which you're using to clean very regularly. Um, we should be following usual instructions uh, with respect to wet dry cleaning of our fragile objects, um, but maybe we should increase the frequency that we do this. So um, often we have uh, uh, trained gallery staff that go through the collection and dust on a weekly basis, and this could be increased to a daily basis. Um, we should uh, ensure that our cleaning staff are well trained and uh, their training is reviewed in these this timeline um, so that they are aware of the new regulations that, uh, that come into there. Um, some few tips are also given about how to manage your visitors um, and to reduce numbers by using booking systems or uh, online ticketing systems. Uh, and um, don't forget to communicate this with your, um, your public. Um, update your websites with uh, your new, perhaps extended visitor time. Uh, schedule and uh, indicate if you have any restrictions on visitor numbers um, on your website too. Um, and I also want to mention or, or remind you not to forget storage um, in times of COVID as well. Uh, storage areas should also be uh, uh, yeah, inspected very uh, frequently and um, there we should have uh, um, hand gel uh, stations or uh, the ability to wash your hands. Um, 
Access should be limited to only necessary staff to uh, ensure that uh, we're not overcrowding these areas. Uh, so perhaps uh, reduce the amount of requests that you have to, um, to study and research your collection. Um, if necessary, you can divide your staff to work on alternate days. And that's what we've done in our conservation studio. We have a rotating system where uh, we have a maximum amount of people per um, the, the uh, volume of the room that we have. And uh, we ensure that we do not over stress our system in that, that manner. Um, Non-essential projects and work should also be postponed. And um, it is perhaps also important to encourage um, your loans to be extended or to reduce um, transport and handling of artworks until this crisis is over. Um, any work that is arriving or uh, your uh, institution should be kept in quarantine um, for a, 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 con yeah, a number of uh, days until the um, virus has had a chance to dissipate and uh, become defunct. Um, there are various recommendations for how long this takes and it depends on the surface that are there. I don't want to go into that in this uh, presentation, but uh, there are very clear recommendations on uh, various sites. So talking about storage, um, back to collection care for paintings. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of how to set up your storage area and uh, what's the do's and the don'ts here. Um, we're seeing two images on the screen for don'ts. And although these are black and white images, you may be surprised to hear that these two images are taken not so long ago in the 1980s. Um, the storages are, uh, that I'm showing here are from the um, the Royal Academy in London, and they show paintings stacked up knee deep uh, against each other um, and very difficult to access and actually potentially quite dangerous. Um, the only thing going for this is that the larger paintings are stacked at the back and the smaller ones at the front. Um, I do not recommend storing, storing your objects, uh, your paintings in this manner. So do check out Reorg, IGNCA is the hub for Reorg in India. So it's very, uh, um, you can invite them to come and give a workshop on Reorg. Um, this is a um, program initiated by ICROM in Rome, uh, where uh, with a small team, you go into your own storage and uh, review the, the storage facilities and reorder it with uh, very little additional um, finances need. Um, so if you would like to have more information about that, um, please do check out the links. Um, showing you now the opposing image. This is uh, uh, two images of a, um, well, a collection, a private collection, but a very rich private collection, and they've gone to the other extreme. Their storage is very clean. Uh, you see the marble floors. And you see the storage racks here. These are rolling storage racks uh, to which you can hang your paintings on. Um, very expensive and um, perhaps well out of the budget that you have. But these provide the best opportunity for storage, storage paintings. Both the front and the reverse can be observed uh, without moving the painting from the rack. Uh, larger paintings can be stored uh, lower and smaller paintings hung above. Um, the environmental controls in this particular storage uh, system are controlled with an HVAC system. And um, there is uh, a security system to minimize access and uh, increase uh, um, security against theft and vandalism. Um, this is something more like uh, what the average collection can uh, afford. Um, many smaller collections do not have the budget for these larger, very expensive systems, although it is, I do recommend using them. Um, but these uh, self-made storage racks uh, can be very effective uh, for uh, storage of paintings. 
Um, and a couple of recommendations. Uh, we are seeing here on the right of the screen some schematics that are uh, given in the Canadian Conservation um, Institute's notes on storage. Um, I am using for a lot of this presentation these notes that are there. Um, and we are seeing self-made racks made out of non uh, uh, of material that does not give off uh, volatile gases, so non poc emitting materials. The paintings can be slide in perpendicular to the rack, um, so they're not stacked against each other. And additional uh, separators can be devised to keep the paintings from touching each other. Um, when we are moving paintings from one uh, area of a collection to another, we should also be aware uh, that uh, damages can happen. Um, accidents do happen in these cases. And we should perhaps prevent these accidents by using, um, we call them dolly, dollies or rollers, um, to move paintings from the storage to the uh, display area. You see here two, um, two uh, uh, examples that can be bought, but you can uh, easily construct something uh, using wooden A-frame and uh, rolling wheel underneath. Um, it does help that your floors or your um, the area you move these rollers over are uh, smooth. So if you are um, moving objects of rough ground and perhaps carrying it is better. Um, we also need to make sure that your artwork are secured well on the rack uh, when you are moving these, which, uh, these, uh, these, these uh, uh, assisting materials and um, that you should always have uh, two people to move these, so one at the front to guide and one at the back and perhaps even a third person to open doors uh, as you move through your your building. Um, when we are move paintings, we should uh, take in a number of considerations beforehand, and one of which is to prepare the area before you arrive. Um, you may carry your object from your storage to your display area, and um, when you get there, you have to put it down uh, before it goes onto the wall and, uh, and is hung. So you should uh, um, invest in constructing some of these padded blocks that I'm showing here. Again, the information, the schematics are taken from the Canadian Conservation um, Institute. Um, these are very simple wooden blocks that have a, a padding uh, um, uh, foam uh, wrapped around them. Uh, I do not recommend uh, bubble wrap or these plastic sheeting, but use some linen cloth or some cotton uh, fabric to wrap around the blocks. And they can be used uh, to hold paintings uh, up against the wall. Um, note the position of the painting on the left uh, as it's resting against the wall. Its paint surface is inward, um, and this gives that a little bit of extra protection. Um, they can also be placed on tables so that uh, paintings can be placed face down. And again, note the position of the painting here, it, the paint surface is face down. And this means that you can carefully check the framing elements um, before um, you turn it up and the painting falls out the frame. Um, paintings, when they're handled, should be handled accordingly to their size. Small paintings can be handled with one person. If the painting has a frame around it, you should always put one hand under the lower edge of the frame and one hand on the side. Anything uh, larger than the painting that I'm showing you here should be handled by two people. And if your painting has uh, no frame or no stretcher, um, provide adequate support. So you see here two of my ex-students uh, moving a canvas painting that has been uh, is partly treated um, from one area of the studio to another, and they have constructed a uh, stiff uh, cardboard um, support on the upper uh, edge of the painting. Actually, it's the lower edge of the painting, but it's the edge they're hang, uh, holding above, um, so that they can move the painting safely. This provides rigidness and stiffness so that the painting is not going to fold and crumple as it's being moved. And if something happens, don't panic. Um, document the accident 
um, don't immediately jump into picking up the pieces, um, document them carefully and assess what needs to happen um, before um, uh, doing any further treatment. Um, do call at this stage a conservator to come and help you and decide what is necessary for your treatment. I'm going to move on to talking about transport of paintings now. Um, transport of paintings uh, is a, something that is also come under collection care. Um, we all work with the institutions now that have a huge loan problem, uh, loan uh, um, uh, programs, and our uh, paintings are moving all over the, the place. So we want to avoid doing, uh, as they've done in this image from the Maritz House, um, a 17th century painting. We can see here early remains of transport, and this is a, a manual labor where the, um, the transporters have a rack on their back and they're stacking the paintings up. And we also want to avoid uh, the image that I'm showing on the right here, where we have uh, um, a very interesting means of carrying the paint by putting a hole in the middle of it. We want to avoid this. So what do we want to do? Well, we want to take our time. Um, when we're moving the painting from the gallery into the conservation studio for packing, we want to uh, look at how it's attached to the wall or how it's attached to the storage frame. We want to ask for help. We want to do this in twos. We want to carry it appropriately and move it off the wall. We want to check our route through to the, um, the conservation studios to make sure that the doors are open and there's no obstacles in the way. We perhaps want a third person to help open doors. Um, we want to make sure that our pads are on the table and, and are there uh, so that we can receive the object and the table is clear of any other objects. Um, we want to carry out the work that is done here. My students are cleaning the back of this panel painting. Um, here we have the curator checking to make sure that it's reframed and uh, in its right position. And uh, then in this case, we are actually hanging it back on the wall after this uh, um, very minimal treatment. But um, we can also start thinking about how to um, prepare this painting for transport to another institution. And uh, to do this, we tend to wrap our paintings. Um, in my institution, we use this uh, material called bubble wrap. It's a polyethylene um, foil that has air pockets in it. Uh, it's very important that the air pockets, the bubbles are on the outside. So any imprint is not imposed in the front of the painting and there's a number of cases that I've come across as a conservator where I'm dealing with the imprint of these bubbles in the paint surface. So one recommendation to avoid this is to pack our paintings with a sheet of cardboard as you see in the image here on the left um, so that the bubble wrap has no contact with our paint surface at all. Um, the paintings uh, should be transported in uh, well um, safely and uh, we do highly recommend building um, boxes uh, so temporary um, transport boxes that we're seeing here again these schematics come from the Canadian Conservation Institute uh, and we see here just four bars um, with a front and back board that are used to provide additional support to our object. Um, this support is, is both physical but also in terms of uh, um, isolation from um, relative humidity uh, fluctuations and the materials act as a buffer uh, and uh, reduce the speed of any fluctuations that happen and also provide additional support against vibration. Um, here's the, the, uh, the painting um, mounted in this travel box. Um, padding can be added around the corners and then the front face of the box can be applied. Um, larger and more delicate objects uh, may need individual um, designed uh, systems. We're seeing here a very large painting, uh, four meters by five meters. 
that is impossible to transport on its original stretcher and frame in a truck. So in this case, we remove it from the stretcher and roll it with the paint side on the outside um, and um, transport this roller. Uh, and we're seeing also on the left here, it's not painting, but it's a painted object. Um, and um, a individual crate is being constructed to house this object and then allow it to be transported. And I want you to note both cases here, these uh, larger transport uh, crates are being moved on these dollies, these um, um, wheeled platforms to ensure that uh, they're more safely moved from one area to another. Um, in the Netherlands, um, we are very lucky to work with a company specifically designed for art um, transport called uh, Hiske van Kralingen. It's a very strange uh, Dutch name, but many transport companies, international transport companies, will have an art transport uh, division. Uh, for transporting objects from A to B using motorized vehicles or even planes, um, it's very important that the object to the painting travels in the correct di direction. And I'm showing here a schematic which shows that the painting should travel in the direction of movement. This reduces vibrations and, and that's very important there. Um, the next aspect that I'd like to talk a little bit about, and as I mentioned, I'm really only touching on um, these topics. There are um, lots of um, further information for those who are more interested in each individual aspect I'm talking about. But the next topic I want to talk about is displaying your painting and hanging it in your gallery. Um, I have seen in numerous cases where paintings have fallen off the wall because the attachments that are used are not sufficient for the weight of the painting or the strength of the wall. Um, and that is very important to, to remember that you have to hold your painting on a wall. And if your wall is temporary, especially with temporary exhibitions, um, you may need to think about uh, hanging it in a slightly different manner. Um, these attachment functions can also act as a security device, and I'll show you some uh, cases of this. Um, but uh, it's worth uh, mentioning, if you do use a lock system on these, that you should uh, provide a layout, a plan uh, of your display for the security professionals in case of disaster. Um, then uh, fire prevention officers or fire officers um, can go quickly to the objects of most important and remove those um, uh, as priority. Um, so how should a painting be hung? Well, a painting should be hung with at least two hooks um, attached to the back of the frame rather than the stretcher. Uh, I'm showing you here again schematic um, from the Canadian Conservation Institute. Uh, where we're showing D-rings that are attached to a, either a textile or a metal um, strip. And these are screwed at uh, quite high up on the frame at the back, parallel to each other. These can then be attached to hooks, um, either um, drilled into the wall or um, S-hooks can be used to attach to storage uh, racks. Um, we really do recommend avoiding picture wire as this can degrade and uh, rust and break. Uh, so especially if you are using picture wires, uh, make sure that you have a, a good quality um, steel wire that can be clamped in position. Um, the other, uh, oh, this is a, an example of one of the security hooks. Um, this is a brand that is called uh, Tamart. Um, I have to admit that it is quite expensive. It comes from Scandinavia and they do um, fit many different typologies. Um, this is one which can be screwed directly into a plate wall. Uh, and as you see, it has a little nut on the top that uh, is closed. Um, so the D-ring seen in the uh, inset on the left there um, cannot be lifted over the uh, L-hook um, once the painting is hanging. Alternative systems exist if you have a permanent display 
um, you may wish to use picture rails and um, picture wire hanging from the rails, uh, as we can see here in the schematic drawing here. Um, this is very useful, as I mentioned, for these more permanent displays. And here we see one uh, case um, of this display type in use. Um, moving further a little bit more to the object and how you display that, I've talked a little bit about uh, glazing uh, as a mitigating um, against the atmospheric pollutants, um, as a buffer for uh, um, uh, mitigating um, relative humidity fluctuations and uh, as a protector against vibrations and, and damage. But what kind of glazing am I talking about? Um, individual paintings can be glazed and this can also increase very quickly in costs. Um, we work at Stral with a company called TrueView um, and they provide both glass and acrylic um, options. And in both options, uh, you have a non-glare variant. Um, so these um, uh, are, and this is an international company and they, I know they do have a deliverer and a, um, a supplier in India. So it is worth uh, looking at their website and um, for finding more information about that. Of course, uh, glazing the object um, has two disadvantages. One is that glare can inhibit the viewer's experience and your collection uh, curator may not want it because of its aesthetic uh, issues. Uh, it does remove the viewer from the object uh, by one aspect. On the plus side, um, um, glazing can be combined with backing boards to create a microclimate box. Um, but I do want to uh, advise you to further investigate microclimate boxes if you are considering those for your individual objects. They are very difficult to maintain and uh, need um, constant management. Uh, um, every at least one to two years, they should be refurbished with the, um, a new and to regulate the climate that's in them. Um, it is very difficult to adequately seal these uh, these microclimates and a bad microclimate inside these kind of uh, enclosures can lead to the formation of mold or even um, changes in the varnish gloss. Um, I'm talking also a little bit about framing here and about the types of um, instruments and, and materials that you can use to frame your, op your, your paintings. Um, the first thing to do is to note whether there is a frame available and if there is not a frame available perhaps you want to discuss with your curator to see whether a frame, the painting should be framed. Um, some modern artists really do not want frames or the frames are um, integral in, in the object itself. Um, the frame does provide some additional uh, prevent uh, some protection to the object. Um, but if not framed correctly, can cause damage as uh, the frame can rub against the painting if the painting is not held fast in the frame. So the first thing we do is we clean what we call the rebate edge, this wooden area around the edge of the painting, uh, the inner edge of the site side of the, the frame. And we, we, we place um, felt in this rebate uh, to stop these vibrations. Um, the next thing we do is we make sure that the object is not going to move in the frame. Um, so we may use spacers to fill up this gap in the rebate. Um, the uh, stretcher or the panel uh, should be held in the, uh, in the frame using uh, appropriate framing clips. Uh, for paintings, we want to make sure that our panel structure has the ability to move and uh, not be held under too much tension in the frame. So we use spring-loaded clips for this, uh, which you see in uh, the, the uh, both images there. These are these sort of S-shaped clips there. For canvas paintings, um, this is less of a problem and uh, we can use these brass strips or even wooden strips to hold them in place. Um, one of the reasons why we use brass strips or the Tamar uh, clips that I'm showing in the 
left hand under image is that they can be bent around the uh, profile of the frame and the stretcher and thus hold the object tightly in the frame. Um, for canvas paintings, these clips should be placed uh, regularly around the perimeter of the stretcher, as we see here in the left image. But for panel paintings, we really want to make sure that the outer uh, portion of our panel has the ability to move. Um, the object I'm showing here on the right is a, a panel painting painted on oak. It's a, a very thin board of only three millimeters. And this is the ability to absorb and uh, release moisture significantly and move. So we can see here that uh, there are two clips in the middle of the panel in the grain direction, uh, and these are held more tightly. And this is where the, there is least movement of the panel support. Whereas the uh, clips on the, um, in, in this, the top and the bottom image here are held uh, much more loosely in the, uh, and not so tight. Um, the framing aspect can be completed by a backing board. Um, backing boards are rigid materials that are used to close the reverse of the painting. Um, here we're seeing a um, sheet of rigid plastic uh, of polycarbonate uh, plastic. Um, and this has an advantage that it is see-through, so you can see the reverse. But uh, card or um, wood supports can also be used as a uh, backing material. Um, these protect against dust and again mitigate vibrations, uh, and they provide additional support against impact damages that can be happen. Um, and again, as I mentioned, uh, they can be sealed in place to create a microclimate. Um, one added ad addition uh, for canvas paintings is a padded um, backing board. Um, these pads of uh, foam, um, we use ether foam um, as shown in the images here, uh, can be used to insert into the um, space left by the stretch stretcher so that the foam has um, uh, contact with the or almost contact with the back of the canvas and again this um, helps mitigate against impact damage and vibrations. Um, the latest research has shown that there should be a little bit of an air buffer gap so that the, um, the vibrations can be taken up a little bit more effectively. Um, so our padding um, leaves about a two millimeter gap uh, behind the um, canvas. If we do place these on, we do want to check the reverse of our canvas paintings regularly on a yearly basis to make sure there is no mold growth or um, fungal growth starting um, behind um, the um, backing board. Um, I'm going to talk about two last aspects before um, closing and opening up this session for question and answers. Um, first of all is that uh, collection care goes hand in hand with registration and uh, condition checking. Um, registration is uh, the, um, done as an object is um, brought into a collection and the object is given an inventory number um, and this is an opportune time to make a condition check. Um, a condition report is based on the close examination of the object from the front, the reverse and the sides and its aim is to um, give an overview of the condition of the object at a single point of time. Um, condition checks are typically carried out as an object arrives in the collection but also as it departs the collection for loan as it arrives in the, um, the uh, museum where it's going to be displayed and on return, the, the situation is, um, is repeated. Um, this allows the conservator to compare back to the original treatment and uh, um, quantify damage if any has occurred at the time. Um, it's also important to note that these condition checks prior to a painting going on loan can actually uh, allow the a recommendation whether or not the painting is safe to go on loan or not. 
Um, there exists a, a number of um, standard condition checks. Again, the Canadian Conservation Heritage Institute has one in their notes that you can use and adapt to your own situation. Um, but it basically includes photographic uh, um, uh, images, as you see here on the, the left, uh, as well as the, the identification details of the individual object and a description of the state of conservation, the varnish layers, the paint layers, the ground layers, uh, the, the support and so on. Um, these uh, condition checks can be augmented by doing some basic technical examination and these techniques of uh, technical examination can help the conserver to decide on what happens to the painting if treatment is necessary. Um, technical examination is again a very large topic and uh, I, I don't have time enough to go into that in this case here beyond saying that each of these techniques will provide further information about the materials and the layer buildup of our painting and thus the problems that the painting occurs. Um, I'm going to finish with a, a little advice about cleaning paintings. Um, not how to clean it, but really on who should be doing the cleaning. Um, we're seeing here cleaning being carried out on the left in the galleries themselves. And this can be done, this is called dusting, and it can be done by trained gallery staff, um, although it should be supervised by a conservator. Uh, recommendations for fragile objects should be given to the gallery staff, uh, and this should happen on a perhaps weekly weekly uh, um, uh, cycle. Um, but when the painting needs further conservation treatment, this should only be done by professionally trained conservators. And this is because cleaning is irreversible and very dangerous for, um, as the selection of cleaning solution needs to be appropriate to materials that has to be removed and also the original um, materials. So if we're carrying out aqueous cleaning for removing of dirt layers or solvent cleaning uh, on the small scale or the large scale for objects, um, this should be done by these trained professionals. And of course, cleaning gives a refreshed view to the object. As we can see here, a yellow varnish layer is being removed from the paint surface, giving a much more um, the viewer the ability to appreciate this object much more. Um, this was my little insight um, back to basics on uh, collection care for paintings. Um, I've provided here some links. Uh, I'll leave the screen up a little bit uh, while I uh, open up the floor to questions and answers. And uh, if you do have any questions, um, please do not, uh, don't hesitate to comment and, and ask me and send me emails as well. And thank you very much for listening. So thank you, Kate, for your such a wonderful talk. I hope this was useful for everyone. And these points can be taken in consideration from today's itself while dealing with the paintings. Once again, I'll thank you, Kate. And now we can take the questions. I have listed some. And the first question is, how can preserve Madhubani painting? Madhubani painting is a traditional painting. It, it's from the it's, uh, Bihar, or one of the state of India. So how this can be preserved is one of the, one of the question. Actually, Madhubani painting is painted uh, with using natural colors, uh, either on wall. It leaves used to be on wall, but nowadays they are painting it on uh, canvas. Yes. Um, this is a pretty difficult question for me because I'm not familiar with this typology of painting, but it sounds to me that it would be a very matte surface and a uh, very porous surface. And uh, I would really advise to get a conservation professional to come and work with you on this. Um, matte and porous surfaces uh, but that have uh, very little binding medium can be very uh, susceptible to rubbing and to removal through any touching. Um, so I really would uh, recommend that you get in touch with a professional to, to help you to do this. Um, any of the 
methodologies that I have discussed can be used to stop dust and dirt from arriving on these objects. So care for the environment. Think of good housekeeping um, so that these objects don't get uh, uh, dirt and damaged. Um, and, and hopefully then you won't need to call the conservator. Thank you. And second question is the about watercolor paintings. And the question is the watercolor paintings are more fragile and how to protect them as the colors fade with time. So again, watercolor paintings are tend to be painted on paper objects, which is not my speciality. So uh, if uh, watercolor paintings come into our collections in the West, we call a paper conservator for advice. Um, however, they can be uh, framed with glazing and uh, mounted and displayed in galleries with very low light levels. The recommendation for watercolors that contain uh, light fugitive uh, pigments is to display at only 50 lux. Uh, and at 50 lux is a, it's like dusk time. Um, I would equate it to about nine o'clock in Delhi. So it's quite low lighting conditions. Uh, but if you have a, a gallery space in your exhibition that has these low lighting, your visitor will accumulate his eye to those uh, light conditions and he will be able to see and appreciate his artwork at this uh, light condition. And rotate them and perhaps not have uh, them on dis constant display, but rotate them. If they're in uh, galleries that have high light conditions, you might want to think of a um, cloth uh, uh, cover for the display case so that the visitor has to lift up the cover and replace it to reduce the light exposure there. And the next question is, can we laminate the paintings? Can we what laminate yeah. paintings? Yes. No, and I'm not going in any further than that. Don't laminate. We do line paintings, but again, uh, this is when the structural, um, the, the support, the canvas or the, uh, is damaged. Uh, and we do adhere another um, canvas to the back of this. And the current practice is to try and use adhesives that do not penetrate into the original materials at all. Um, any impregnation with a consolidant or a uh, lining adhesive or even a varnish is irreversible. We cannot remove that material from the original structure uh, and show that should be done with care. And again, call a conservator. Okay, and the next question is about the present scenario about the lock, about all, all about the lockdown. And the question is, is uh, everything is shut nowadays? And what is the first state when the storage and repository will open? So what should be the first step in the first state at that time? Take your time. Go in slowly uh, with few people and look to see if there is any damage. Um, make sure that there's nothing fallen over. Um, and start to, to, to uh, look at the, the, the situation. Um, if the, if there has been from the virus into that collection you need to 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 dust it down and clean it but be you know we are the ones that are carrying the virus um, it doesn't spread very far on its own um, but uh, a good dusting and cleaning as we suggested on the slides as icom cc has suggested uh, follow those um, uh, follow the advice there yeah, this was a good question, in fact. And yeah. the next question is, since lighting is a major problem in Indian museums, adding to deterioration in collection, are there any significant books or articles describing lighting techniques that you can recommend to them? Uh, the, uh, um, yes, there's a number of books. There is a um, one of the first seminal um, books on this is by Gary Thompson, talking about lighting conditions. Um, he's going to give you lots of recommendations on how to deal with this and more for the West than it is for India, but common sense. Um, there is also up-to-date information from the Dutch uh, Heritage uh, Institute, ECROM, and almost, you know, if you Google museum lighting, you will, you will get a lot of resources. Think commonly, you want to reduce light on your collection. 
Um, so as I said, you can do that by using blinds at your light source, by changing your lighting, artificial lighting systems to contain uh, light sources that have no UV, um, to maybe protect individual uh, objects with uh, cloth uh, covers, um, be a little bit creative uh, and, and think a little bit about it. And, you know, there are, uh, there's advice as well. So um, ask um, those who are working in collections in India, they have uh, good information. Okay, and next question is uh, for hot and humid climate, will glazing and adding backing to oil painting making it susceptible to humid microclimate? inside the glazing thereby increasing risk of mold growth yes uh, and i've seen that in a number of collections um good ventilation opening up these uh, backing boards if they are there considering re replacing them with uh, materials um that are a little bit more uh, have more ventilation ability so uh yeah, um I've seen a lot of leather backings uh, on on canvas paintings on uh, well European paintings uh, in collections. Um, these could be replaced by a canvas that allows some porosity and some ventilation through them. Um, you have to think about why the glazing is on there. Um, perhaps in your home institution and in your home display, the glazing is not necessary. You could uh, hang the painting higher if you think that uh, it's to do with touch. Um, and if you are transporting the painting, then perhaps the glazing comes back. Don't throw it away, put it in storage, put it mark on that this is uh, the glazing for this particular object. Perhaps you don't need to glaze it in your collection. And the next question is, uh, are synthetic frames safe for oil paintings? Let's about the synthetic frames. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by synthetic frames. Uh, are you talking about plastic frames or metal frames or? or um, plastic frames. Huh? Maybe plastic, yes, maybe plastic frames or polymers. Uh, uh, um, my immediate reaction here is is more an aesthetical issue than it is a, a, a preventive conservation issue. Um, I don't see why plastic frames should be a problem. They're quite hard surfaces, so again, I would uh, put felt in the rebate so that any contact with the um, original object is uh, reduced by that, those hard uh, surfaces. To, to stop rubbing and abrasion along the rebate edge. Um, but I'm asking why synthetic frames? Okay, I think. And next question is about the uh, padding. Does padding won't get create further deterioration to the painting? Um, sorry, can you repeat that again, Anil? Yes, it's about the padding. If yeah. we are doing the padding, so does that padding want to create further deterioration to the painting? Or well, the padding, um, the we're talking about. that yeah. you uh, mentioned. Yeah, the padding that I mentioned is temporary. It, uh, and it's really used to help us move paintings um, or keep them in storage um, sufficiently. So um, you just don't want to put something like a, a delicate frame on a hard surface um, and a cloth padding would be sufficient there or a foam padding would be sufficient there to, to hold it um, securely. Um, and the pads that I showed you for placing the object on um, when you're moving it, these should be covered in cloth, not plastic. And uh, obviously you have to check the object for fragile corners before you put them on the object. And if the corners of the frame are fragile, then you have to be very careful and consolidate or treat those before you, um, you place them on these pads. Okay, and the next question is about, I think it's about the wash technique of the painting and it's about the storage, how to store the paintings done with the wash technique. Um, wash technique, uh, can you give me a little bit more insight it, into it that? Is a, it, is an, it is an aquarelle where you uh, paint on a paper and then you wash it and then you paint so to get a uh, transparency into the painting. It is a watercolor painting. Uh, mm. You do 
wash technique to give transparency yeah. uh, into the thing. It was very popular in, we... uh, in Bengal School of India. Okay. I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm understanding a little bit more. Yeah, this is a, a sort of a subcategory of watercolor painting. Um, again, the recommendations that I gave for the earlier question on watercolor painting uh, would here um, be appropriate. And again, because it's on a paper support, probably, um, I would also talk to paper conservators of how to treat the support. Um, yeah, and store it carefully, um, perhaps flat, um, and uh, maybe in a cylinder box um, with acid-free cardboard in between the different, uh, um, if you're storing more than one in a box. Uh, so you can use acid-free um, passport two carton in between different uh, uh, of these supports uh, for these paintings. And I think this, this is the last question. If the museum only uses air conditioning in the storage room, does it need to be turned on every day? It's a very good question about turning on and off. Uh, I mean, we actually deal with this in our um, own studio on a daily basis. We have an air uh, system that uh, works in working hours and doesn't at night. Um, so we have... Uh, two rooms within our studios which have additional instrumentation, um, dehumidifiers that um, maintain the relative humidity at a more standard level. So our objects, if they are fragile, if they are very responsive to relative humidity changes, we move them into these rooms in the case that our air conditioning, um, yeah, if our climate is fluctuating wildly. Um, so, if your air conditioning is on and it is actually changing the conditions inside to a set point and at uh, night or when it is off in times of COVID, um, then move your objects into a, an area that has less fluctuations. Uh, and I think that that's the, the, the best advice is to, to monitor your environment, know your environment that it is. Um, to avoid this ups and downs. Um, that's, that's really what you want to do. Uh, a slow change is better than a rapid uh, response. So uh, still we are getting the questions, but I'll take the last question and then we'll move further. And the question is the oldest painting there to ever conserved. What was the condition before the conservation process <laughs> and after? I think the oldest ones that I have worked on, uh, I showed you a, a brief glimpse into that, um, is this uh, panel painting from Spain, um, where the, the woodworm had eaten uh, drastically the support. But the support was a four centimeter thick panel originally, and uh, even in its uh, very worm eaten condition, it had enough structural support to hold the layers above. Uh, so we did, uh, we only made sure that the woodworm um, activity was, was uh, void, it was uh, not active anymore, um, which had been for a long time. Uh, and we uh, provided some additional um, uh, physical support, um, but we didn't consolidate the wood. Uh, we did not impregnate the, wood, impregnate the wood with any materials and we uh, cleaned the front um, of uh, non-original varnishes and dirt layer and retouched the damages and then returned it to the collection. The collection is a museum and the uh, environments are, are well controlled so we thought that the, the, the support itself was uh, sufficiently strong to um, resist these changes, the, the, this, any changes in the climate there. Okay, thank you so much, Kate, for your nice talk and also the participants coming with the nice questions. So now I know- Thank you, really good question. To Dr. Yes, yes, yeah, of course. And now I'll invite Dr. Achal Pandya for official vote of thanks. So, sir, please. Thank you, Anil. In fact, uh, I would really like to thank uh, Member Secretary Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts who 
has been very encouraging and allowing us to go for these webinars for whichever uh, target audience uh, is really uh, high and uh, as a national uh, institution our mandate of uh, disseminating knowledge related to conservation to uh, the large public uh, is fulfilled. I'm really very really thankful to uh, Dr. Sachin and Mushigi. And uh, I have no words to thank uh, Kate Simoon for uh, really agreeing. Uh, I know she is really very busy. She, uh, I don't know how many hours she has in a day. And, uh, <laughs> and she could manage uh, to come for this uh, talk. Uh, so I'm really, really have no words to thank her. And uh, I'll, whenever you are preparing for such webinars, it requires a lot of efforts. What we have seen in an hour, I think more, much more uh, hours would have gone into uh, such presentations. Thank you very much, Kate, for uh, agreeing uh, participate to, uh, to deliver the talk and also for continuing the, uh, the long collaboration that IGNC has been uh, going on with uh, Sal in the previous time where you and Rene Bokenbauer have been very, very supportive uh, for all the uh, endeavors. Thank you very much, Kate and Rene. I am also very thankful to uh, my colleague, uh, Anand Divedi, who did a fantastic job as a moderator and uh, Thank you, sir. really uh, all the questions which were asked uh, in this webinar nicely and Kate answered them uh, really. I think most of them are satisfied. We also saw some of them have also yeah. written thank you uh, for the answer. So thank you very much uh, Anil and for such a fantastic uh, moderation. I'm very thankful to all my colleagues at IGNC who have been supporting us uh, in organizing this webinar. And uh, I'm also thankful to the colleagues of IGNC uh, who have been working day and night uh, for the publicity of these uh, webinars and also for helping uh, the division in uh, organizing the webinars. And uh, thanks are also due to uh, Digital India for setting up, the, up this, uh, this webinar uh, and for really conducting it uh, smoothly. And uh, I would be failing in my duty if I don't thank the audiences who, audience who listened to the webinar carefully and participated uh, uh, actively uh, by asking questions. Thank you very much. And uh, with this, uh, we come to the close of this uh, seminar. And uh, I thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye.